very optimistic because <coughs> um, for something to be done about privacy, you need to have interest. And there has never been as much interest in privacy as we have today in 2016. I've watched the interest grow over the past 30 years and I've watched it explode over the past three years. And even if you look at the way that private companies, for example, companies in the private sector are now treating privacy and just look at the last two to three years alone, how many of the larger companies have introduced encryption end-to-end, -end, encryption in transit, encryption of data at rest, encryption messaging systems. And why do they do that? It's because there is now perceived to be a commercial value to this, right? If market forces dictate that you look at supply and you look at demand, there is demand for privacy and the companies are coming up with supply for privacy. So that, to me, is very encouraging. I've spent several months now identifying issues, and we're now prioritizing sets of issues. Right? So the first set of issues, which I have publicized in early June, as being the first set of five priorities includes the following. It includes big data and open data as one stream of action. It includes medical data as another stream of action. It includes personal data which is held by corporations in the private sector as another stream of action. It includes security and surveillance as another stream of action, and it includes also a stream of action dedicated to achieving a better understanding of privacy. In each of these streams of actions, it's my intention to set up a task force of volunteers. I hope to say more about that in this interview and later. And by having a well-structured team of committed people who can then move forward to study each of these themes in more depth, first individually and then bring them together. You cannot talk of big data and medical data and not talk of bringing them together, right? Because medical data will insert, will intersect with big data and open data in many ways. But the first thing we do is look at big data and open data in many sectors, including social security, including research, including other areas, and then eventually get it to intersect with the other thematic action streams, which I have outlined as being our first set of priorities. That's an easy one, both, right? To me, privacy is a very important standalone fundamental right, right? Um, a right which is universal, but it's also an enabling right. And if you think of the question, why privacy? Why is privacy important? My answer more and more, but has been the same answer for the past 30 years or more now, and I'm sharing this answer with you because I think that we have seen that many people are finding it a useful way to frame the answer to the question is, I look at privacy as one of those information-related rights which enables me to be who I am. And more than that, also to be who I want to be, to become whom I want to be. And what am I talking about here? I'm talking about my personality. How does my personality develop? And where do I get my freedom? to develop my personality. In many systems of law, in Europe, South America, other places, this right is already a constitutionally protected right, the right to free and hinder development of personality. And privacy is one of those three fundamental rights, information-related fundamental rights, which are essential to the development of one's personality. And these include the freedom of expression, 
the freedom of access to information and also privacy. Put those together and you can create a space within which an individual or a group can interact, can receive information, can impart information, can read the book in peace and quiet in a private environment, they can have a discussion in a private environment, they can, through that discussion, develop their thinking about something, but they can also use the private space to discover their own sexual identity, to develop their sexual identity in whichever direction they please. And it is these many dimensions of one's personality which are so closely and intimately linked to privacy. Insofar as online privacy is concerned, <clears throat> I think that it would be fair to say that it won't be just one topic which would be uh, important. Certainly, the topic which tend, the two topics I would say, which tend to have dominated the um, the waves, the airwaves, the print media, other media over the past three years, would remain the same. Which is to say, on the one hand what is going to happen with our movements on the internet, uh, our internet-related behavior and security and surveillance, because there's clearly uh, massive privacy implications there, but also what's going to happen to all the data which is held by corporations in the private sector about our transactions on the internet. And I think that in that context, those will be two of the biggest subjects. However, a third subject which I see coming up, of course, is how do you link our behavior on the internet to behavior in other spaces? So when you leave cyberspace and you walk through the street, when you look at the internet of things, what happens? And what happens when you link up the data, sometimes transmitted via IP2, right? What happens when you link up that data to the movements that you're making in cyberspace? Put those together and you could have a very intimate and detailed uh, picture of what you have been doing during a day. Is that permissible? Should it be permissible? So basically, I think that the third dimension to my answer is it's not only what you do in cyberspace, it's what you do outside cyberspace and when you link that up, possibly using cyberspace together, that you can have a better answer to what some of the big questions will be over the next five years.